When Zarathustra was thirty years old, he left his home and the lake of his home and went into the mountains. Here he savored his spirit and his solitude and would for ten years not weary of them. These are the first two lines of Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. Odd as it may sound, there is a great deal to unpack already. First of all, Zarathustra is 30 years old when he leaves home. Traditionally, this is the same age as Jesus when he left his home. Jesus was baptized by John in the River Jordan and then departed into the desert to fast and pray. So, right off the bat, Zarathustra parallels Jesus and in fact, throughout the book, we shall see repeated parallels as well as pointed contrasts between these two figures. This culminates in a remarkable statement made near the end of book three in the chapter on old and new tablets, where Zarathustra declares, quote, My brothers, there was a man who once looked into the hearts of the good and the just, and he spoke, They are Pharisees but he was not understood. The second one, however, who discovered their land, the land, hearts, and soil of the good and just, he was the one who asked, Whom do they hate the most? The Creator they hate the most, he who breaks tablets and old values. Unquote. That last statement is something Zarathustra already said in section 9 of the prologue, as we shall see when we get to that. Thus, Zarathustra implies that Jesus was the first to critique morality, with Zarathustra being the second. Jesus is taken to be, in this case, a forerunner, a shadow, perhaps even a first coming of Zarathustra. At the very least, Zarathustra considers Jesus to be a kindred spirit. One of the principal differences between these two is revealed at the end of Book 1 in the chapter entitled On Free Death, or On Voluntary Death, or, if one is willing to acknowledge a pun, on Freien, I think that's how you pronounce it, it's a German word, it it, while normally it's an adjective meaning free, that's how it's normally translated, archaically it's apparently a verb which could mean to marry, court, woo, proposition. Hence there could be a secondary punned meaning here on wooing death. So on the free death or on the voluntary death versus on wooing death. By the way, I can't resist this little side note. Wooing, courting, and amorous imagery can be found throughout Thus Spake Zarathustra and Nietzsche's writings in general. His concern with marriage, sex, and amore is something which sets him apart from almost every other great philosopher with the exception of Plato. But even Plato is chiefly concerned with homosexual love affairs, whereas Nietzsche is preoccupied with heterosexual marriage and reproduction. He is, in this sense, possibly the only heteroerotic philosopher in the West, at least to my knowledge. The exceptions, I suspect, are among medieval mystics and theologians. The Islamic mystics are another story, just read Rumi, but um, anyway, what was I talking about? One of the principal differences between Zarathustra and Jesus is revealed in the chapter On Free Death, where Zarathustra declares, quote, Truly, too early did that Hebrew die, the one who is honored by the preachers of slow death, and for many it has since become their doom that he died too early. He still knew only tears and the melancholy of the Hebrews, together with the hatred of the good and just. The Hebrew Jesus, then longing for death, overcame him. If only he had remained in the desert and far away from the good and the just, perhaps he would have learned to live and to love the earth, and even to laugh. Believe me, my brothers, he died too early 
he himself would have recanted his teaching if he had reached my age. He was noble enough for recanting, but he had not yet matured. I can't resist throwing in that sometimes I say the exact same thing about Nietzsche, but anyway, <laughs> that's my little joke at his expense. The key phrase here for our purposes is, quote, if only he, Jesus, had remained in the desert and far away from the good and the just, unquote. So, whereas Jesus only stays in the desert for 40 days before beginning his ministry, Zarathustra spends 10 whole years in the mountains before he returns to humankind. In Zarathustra's view, Jesus was undercooked. He should have remained in isolation long enough to cleanse himself of the maddening crowd. He was not yet ripe. He began too early. On the other hand, we could just as well say that Zarathustra was overcooked. By the time he returns to humankind, they cannot understand what he's talking about. He has grown too distant from them in order to converse with them meaningfully. And he admits as much when, after his failed speeches to the crowd, he thinks, quote, too long, it seems, lived I in the mountains, too much listed I to brooks and trees. Now I address the people like goat herders, unquote. So we have a dichotomy here between social intelligibility on the one hand and individuality on the other. Zarathustra goes into solitude in order to purify himself of the crowd and discover who he himself is, apart from the influence and pressures of society. A major theme running through Zarathustra is that of separation from the masses for the purpose of self-discovery. Jesus, says Zarathustra, did not sufficiently enjoy his solitude, hence he did not succeed in transcending the inheritance of his particular culture and society, in this case, the tears and melancholy of the Hebrews, nor did he evade the destructive attentions of the good and just, that is, those who promote and enforce the, according to Zarathustra, arbitrary mores of a particular society. Society homogenizes necessarily. There's a couple of passages I want to quote from at this point in order to provide additional commentary here. First, we have a section from Beyond Good and Evil, number 268. Quote, words are acoustical signs for concepts. Concepts, however, are more or less definite image signs for often recurring and associated sensations, for groups of sensations. To understand one another, it is not enough that one use the same words. One also has to use the same words for the same kinds of inner experiences. In the end, one has to have one's experiences in common. Therefore, the human beings of one people understand one another better than those belonging to different peoples, even if they employ the same language, or rather, when human beings have long lived together under similar conditions of climate, soil, danger, needs, and work, what results from this is people who understand one another, a people. In all souls, an equal number of often recurring experiences has come to be predominant over experiences that come more rarely. On the basis of the former, one understands the other, quickly and ever more quickly. The history of language is the history of a process of abbreviation. And on the basis of such quick understanding, one associates ever more closely. Subcultures develop their own lingo. Why? Because they need new words to describe experiences which they all have shared as a direct result of being part of the subculture. Neo-Jungian typology is a perfect example of this. This is the whole mechanism behind inside jokes. For Nietzsche, the commonest folk, if you will, 
are those whose inside jokes are shared with the widest circles of people. Consequently, they have nothing unique to themselves, no spiritual private property, as it were. They are dissipated spiritually among the crowd. The noble folk, for Nietzsche, are noble because of their distinguishing experiences, as mediated by a distinct and distinguishing character. Simply put, they are not like everyone else, both in their nature and in their life experiences. As a natural result, they are at a great disadvantage when it comes to communicating with everyone else. How very special it is to find that one other person who gets you, one who has had the very peculiar kinds of experiences that you have had, so that they know exactly what you are saying when you use this or that phrase. In section 270 of Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche writes, quote, the spiritual haughtiness and nausea of every man who has suffered profoundly, it almost determines the order of rank how profoundly human beings can suffer. His shuddering certainty, which permeates and colors him through and through, that by virtue of his suffering, he knows more than the cleverest and wisest could possibly know, and that he knows his way and has once been at home in many distant, terrifying worlds of which you know nothing. This spiritual and silent haughtiness of the sufferer, this pride of the elect of knowledge, of the initiated, of the almost sacrificed, finds all kinds of disguises necessary to protect itself against contact with obtrusive and pitying hands, and altogether against everything that is not its equal in suffering. Profound suffering makes noble. It separates." Unquote. And indeed, there will be some hints throughout the book that Zarathustra's departure for the mountains was not motivated by a wistful wanderlust, but by a deeply painful spiritual crisis. But more on that later. I would like to give a few examples of just this sort of thing. First of all, for many long stretches of human history, this was precisely the situation of homosexuals, of transgenders, of religious heretics, and anyone else whose deepest and most spiritual desires, for I am more and more convinced that the erotic and the religious are deeply intertwined, almost identifiable, but that's a whole other can of worms and topic. These individuals were unaligned with the overwhelming majority around them. One of the principal anguishes of this is precisely the fact that one's own family, friends, and leadership, everyone who ought to be the most sympathetic, comforting, stabilizing, understanding, are necessarily cut off from you. They may even become the most dangerous people in your life. For prior at least to the 21st century, if, say, a homosexual person attempted to explain themselves, there was no way for them to be understood. Those around them are cut off by simple lack of experience and are virtually guaranteed to react with hostility, disgust, defensiveness, righteous indignation, or perhaps, worst of all, a misplaced pity a desire to cure, a desire to repress or steal away the thorn in one's flesh, to destroy this cruel bestowment or affordance of deity. And note that the very same language can be used of the religious heretic. Again, that's another, that's a whole other can of worms. The one so afflicted is then by necessity driven into solitude, either physically or just mentally. And in that solitude, they begin to undergo an alchemical transformation where all manner of internal snares lay in wait to ruin their becoming something greater than could have otherwise been possible. 
They have to walk a tightrope between two extremes, two directions of possible failure. We are here to become nobility. Therefore, we are here to suffer. A second example, exemplary but disturbing, is found in the early life of Carl Jung. This is from his own account in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is a kind of autobiography. When Jung was only 12 years old, he had a terrifying experience. He was walking by a beautiful cathedral when he began to think what he sensed would be a terrible, sinful thought. He caught himself and refused to let the thought continue its course. He was afraid that if he allowed himself to think it, he would commit the unforgivable sin, namely a denial of the Holy Ghost. He spent the rest of the day in a terrible state of anxiety. When he returned home, his mother sensed his distress, but he was unable to tell her what was wrong for fear that doing so would cause him to think the thought. He spent two days like this in agony. On the third night, in a state of desperation, he reasoned his way to the conclusion that, quote, God himself had placed me in this situation. The only question was what God wanted him to do. Young did not feel that God was helping him to fend off the thought, though he dearly wanted and prayed for God to do so. I am now going to read an extensive quotation from, uh, from Jung himself. So, quote, God knows that I cannot resist much longer. This is Jung speaking for his young self. And he does not help me, although I am on the point of having to commit the unforgivable sin. In his omnipotence, he could easily lift this compulsion from me, but evidently he is not going to. Can it be that he wishes to test my obedience by imposing on me the unusual task of doing something against my own moral judgment and against the teachings of my religion, and even against his own commandment, something I am resisting with all my strength because I fear eternal damnation. Is it possible that God wishes to see whether I am capable of obeying his will, even though my faith and my reason raise before me the specters of death and hell? That might really be the answer. But these are merely my own thoughts. I may be mistaken. I dare not trust my own reasoning as far as that. I must think it all through once more. I thought it all over again and arrived at the same conclusion. Obviously, God also desires me to show courage, I thought. If that is so, and I go through with it, then he will give me his grace and illumination. I gathered all my courage as though I were about to leap forthwith into hellfire and let the thought come. I saw before me the cathedral, the blue sky. God sits on his golden throne high above the world, and from under the throne an enormous turd falls upon the sparkling new roof, shatters it, and breaks the walls of the cathedral asunder. So that was it. I felt an enormous, indescribable relief. Instead of the expected damnation, grace had come upon me, and with it an unutterable bliss, such as I had never known. I wept for happiness and gratitude. The wisdom and goodness of God had been revealed to me now that I had yielded to his inexorable command. It was as though I had experienced an illumination. A great many things I had not previously understood became clear to me. That was what my father had not understood, I thought. He had failed to experience the will of God, had opposed it for the best reasons and out of the deepest faith, 
And that was why he had never experienced the miracle of grace, which heals all and makes all comprehensible. He had taken the Bible's commandments as his guide. He believed in God as the Bible prescribed and as his forefathers had taught him. But he did not know the immediate living God who stands omnipotent and free above his Bible and his church, who calls upon man to partake of his freedom and can force him to renounce his own views and convictions in order to fulfill without reserve the command of God. In his trial of human courage, God refuses to abide by traditions, no matter how sacred. In his omnipotence, he will see to it that nothing really evil comes of such tests of courage. If one fulfills the will of God, one can be sure of going the right way. God had also created Adam and Eve in such a way that they had to think what they did not at all want to think. He had done that in order to find out whether they were obedient, and he could also demand something of me that I would have had to reject on traditional religious grounds. It was obedience which brought me grace. And after that experience, I knew what God's grace was. One must be utterly abandoned to God. Nothing matters but fulfilling his will. Otherwise, all is folly and meaningless. From that moment on, when I experienced grace, my true responsibility began. Why did God befoul his cathedral? That, for me, was a terrible thought. But then came the dim understanding that God could be something terrible. I had experienced a dark and terrible secret. It overshadowed my whole life, and I became deeply pensive. Sometimes I had the overwhelming urge to speak, only to hint that there were some curious things about me which no one knew of. I wanted to find out whether other people had undergone similar experiences. I never succeeded in discovering so much as a trace of them in others. As a result, I had the feeling that I was either outlawed or elect, accursed or blessed. My entire youth can be understood in terms of this secret. It induced in me an almost unendurable loneliness. My one great achievement during those years was that I resisted the temptation to talk about it with anyone. Thus, the pattern of my relationship to the world was already prefigured. Today, as then, I am a solitary because I know things and must hint at things which other people do not know and usually do not even want to know. Whenever I listened to the Parsons, I had the feeling, yes, yes, that is all very well, but what about the secret? The secret is also the secret of grace. None of you know anything about that. Unquote. I confess that in editing down, as particularly the, the last few passages, I have actually taken out some of the even stranger aspects. Uh, for instance, Jung has a very specific conviction that God was forcing him to think these evil thoughts so that he could experience God's grace. I don't want to get into a discussion about all those kinds of theological questions, which in some sense is just my point. Jung experienced something. He, he experienced it, and it set him apart, and it made it impossible for others to fully understand him, and yet he was in a privileged position to understand them, at least in certain aspects. The next quote is from an anthropology book called Pierced by Murrigan's Lance, Ritual, Power, and Moral Redemption Among Malaysian Hindus by Elizabeth Fuller Collins. On page 44, she writes, quote, The collective ritual patterns for worship of the God King and the village Amun goddesses 
contrast with worship of a chosen deity who grants individual salvation. As Dumont has pointed out, the ascetic practices of bhakti devotionalism are modeled on the behavior of the religious hermit, who chooses to live in isolation outside the social order, renouncing the world of relationships and thereby escaping being defined by caste. A. K. Ramonujan writes, quote, Every pigeonhole of caste, ritual, gender, appropriate clothing and custom, stage of life, the whole system of homo hierarchicus is the target of its, that is the hermit's, irony. The devotee who identifies with the divine stands in contrast to homo hierarchicus, the person of caste, the self in relation, whose identity is ordered by relationships of deference and duty, high caste versus low caste, father versus son, older brother versus younger brother, husband versus wife. Unquote. The hermit escapes the social order, which tells him or her what he or she is. The hermit escapes the given categories of their society and culture and tries to discover the categories already inherent within them, a very tricky and dangerous business, as I said. One major aspect of Zarathustra's teaching is giving cryptic advice as to how one does just this, how one plays the role of an alchemist upon one's own leaden soul. I also want to draw attention to the fact that the hermit is seeking a personal God offering personal salvation, a salvation that is not afforded or affordable by the community. On this note, I will quote from Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling. Kierkegaard, through the pseudonym of Johannes de Silencio, gives a grave and haunting analysis of the biblical story of the binding of Isaac, that is, the occasion when God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, and Abraham, obedient to the end, was willing to do it, only to be stopped by an angel just before he could actually plunge the knife into Isaac, who was, it seems fairly clear, willingly bound to the altar, by the way. So this is a dual effort. With this in mind, I quote, The ethical as such is the universal, and as the universal, it applies to everyone. We may think here of the universal as uh, society, culture, communal mores. That's what's meant by the universal here, more or less. The individual's ethical task is always to express himself in this, to abrogate his particularity so as to become the universal, that is, become one with the society, totally aligned with the society. As soon as the single individual wants to assert himself in his particularity, in direct opposition to the universal, he sins. And only by recognizing this can he again reconcile himself with the universal. Whenever, having entered the universal, the single individual feels an urge to assert his particularity, he is in a state of temptation from which he can extricate himself only by surrendering his particularity to the universal in repentance. Kierkegaard goes on to note how the heroes of tragic myth never go beyond the ethical. That is to say, they are tragic chiefly because they sacrifice their own desires and interests to the ethical, the universal, which is identified with the universally true, that is, with the community or the greater good. So you have Agamemnon sacrifices Iphigenia for the sake of Greece's war with Troy. Brutus betrays Caesar for the sake of the Republic. Oedipus blinds and exiles himself to save his plagued city, etc. They did what they did precisely because they judged it to be the most ethical course of action, the action for the greater good, 
but that action tragically resulted in their own self-destruction. Quote, with Abraham, it is different. This is Kierkegaard again. Quote, Abraham's whole action stands in no relation to the universal. It is a purely private undertaking. While, then, the tragic hero is great through his deeds being an expression of the ethical life, Abraham is great through an act of purely personal virtue. What we usually call a temptation is something that keeps a person from carrying out a duty. But here the temptation is the ethical itself, which would keep Abraham from doing God's will. Here we see the need for a new category for understanding Abraham. Such a relationship to the divine is unknown to paganism. The tragic hero enters into no private relationship with God, for the ethical is the divine. Abraham cannot be mediated, which can also be put by saying he cannot speak. The moment I speak, I express the universal. Since language, this is me right now, since language, as Nietzsche pointed out earlier, is tied to a culture, to a people, to a society. So to speak is to express the universal. So continuing, quote, and when I do not speak, no one can understand me. So the moment Abraham wants to express himself in the universal, that is to other people, he has to say that his situation is one of temptation. Unquote. Because those other people cannot understand it in any other way. And I would also like to mention here that Kierkegaard's notion of Abraham not speaking is very reminiscent of Wittgenstein's famous statement, quote, What can be said at all can be said clearly, and whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Unquote. The whole Tractatus Logico Philosophicus could be interpreted as Wittgenstein attempting to circumscribe social intelligibility as such in the form of logic, precisely so that he can show that the genuinely human part of life, which involves the religious, the aesthetic, the moral, these things cannot be talked of meaningfully by society. Just a thought. I know that uh, Wittgenstein has clearly been linked with Kierkegaard. That's not news to, to anybody in the know, but um, I still thought this particular interpretation was interesting. Now, a few final points to summarize what I've said here and give a couple more comments. The rare experience cannot be communicated until two people have it and can pinpoint the experience. This is exactly the trouble with typology, by the way, and half of the disagreements I meet with in everyday life are precisely this. Two people are actually talking about the same thing but don't realize it because the language is different. This is the situation of Babel. When a people who all have the same experiences but have developed different ways of talking about those experiences, they end up fighting over nothing. Compare this to an individual who has a unique experience not shared by the community. He can talk about it, but they cannot understand him. Kierkegaard points out that this becomes pretty radical since Abraham cannot express his situation except by saying he is being tempted by God to do something incredibly unethical. The ethical categories in which he was raised do not allow him to express accurately what is, a what is actually happening. He has to slander it in order to speak. Something similar is perhaps happening with Nietzsche when he talks of, say, exploitation, or good and evil, or immoralism, or some of the other words that he uses. Anyway, there you have it. Uh, would you believe me if I said that we have only covered about half of what I want to say about just these first two lines? Um, yeah, that, this is not how it's going to be throughout the entire commentary, but there's definitely going to be some front-loaded information um, as I get out all of these associations. But as we move forward, I'm sure that we'll pick up the pace as I make more... Uh, 
I'm able to just refer back to things that I had already said. So we'll see how it goes. But this is what came out of me in regard to these very first two lines. So we're just going to go at the pace that we need to go at. So, so much for the first part of the video. Let's move into the second. I'm going to reread those first two lines again just to reset us a bit. When Zarathustra was thirty years old, he left his home and the lake of his home and went into the mountains. Here he savored his spirit and his solitude and would for ten years not weary of them. So Zarathustra moves from a lake up into the mountains. In other words, he moves from the lowest point, which is where water is able to pool and gather, up to the highest point, the mountaintops, from whence the rivers and streams originate, usually from melting snow. Water is pulled down by gravity. We, too, are pulled down by gravity. It is precisely for this reason that climbing a mountain is difficult. Gravity is the force that would equalize all things by drawing everything down into a smooth, tightly packed sphere. Great counterforces must be employed to overcome this natural tendency, the tendency to accumulate at a shared center. One must struggle upwards in order to become more separate, more unique, more individual, and thus more alone. Symbolically speaking, gravity is the force that collectivizes. It is the entropic pull towards herd-like behavior, towards conformity, towards an unquestioning acceptance and embodiment of one's born culture, language, and morals. But to become individual, to discover who you yourself really are, you must fight against this gravitational pull. Zarathustra's enemy, as he says several times in the books, is the spirit of gravity. Now, in the second essay of On the Genealogy of Morality, Nietzsche endeavors to explain just how it is that nature could, quote, breed an animal with the right to make promises, unquote. To have the right to make promises means for Nietzsche, that one is capable of keeping them, and that one knows that one is capable of keeping them. One can, quote, stand security for his own future, unquote. One has the capacity for responsibility. In other words, one is capable of dictating commands to oneself and expecting them to be followed by oneself. The ability to make and keep promises in this way is the chief sign of self-mastery. And perhaps self-mastery consists of nothing else than just this. One can keep a promise to oneself as well as a promise to others. In other words, one is capable of willing into the future. Nietzsche is assuming here that non-human animals have not attained this capacity. Animals are instinctual. They know what they are doing right now because their instincts tell them, and their instincts are almost always right. Their instincts, after all, have been refined by eons of evolution. It is not necessary for them to think or plan. They simply do when the time comes. Their course in life is dictated by certain bodily rhythms, and everything works out marvelously so long as those rhythms remain harmonized with their environment. But the human, the human being, can will into the future. Thus, the human has the ability to make and keep promises. This implies a whole complex of concepts that make this possible. For, for one, that I am a unit, I'm a moral subject who bears responsibility and will, is a center of will, or that there is a predictable cause and effect set of relations, that the world operates according to something like cause and effect between my actions and the environment. Without that, it wouldn't make any sense to talk about me being able to will into the future. 
Uh, all of this is naturally tied up with the notion of consciousness and conscience. One becomes aware of oneself as a willing and responsible being, and one feels guilt for not keeping promises that one has made, for not willing into the future and following through on a command. One begins to have pangs of conscience. One holds oneself to account. One is hard on oneself. One disciplines and even punishes oneself. One beats oneself into submission. Potentially, one hates oneself for one's inability to obey, for one's powerlessness. On the other hand, one may come to love oneself precisely because one has demonstrated power over oneself. I said I would do it, and I did it against all opposition. Human beings are uniquely capable of good and bad conscience, that is, of either affirming or despising themselves, and doing so consciously. All of this is important background for the following quotation from section 16 of that essay, second essay of Genealogy of Morality. Quote, I regard the bad conscience as the serious illness that man was bound to contract under the stress of the most fundamental change he ever experienced, that change which occurred when he found himself finally enclosed within the walls of society and of peace. The situation that faced sea animals when they were compelled to become land animals or perish was the same as that which faced these semi-animals, well adapted to the wilderness, to war, to prowling, to adventure. Suddenly, all their instincts were disvalued and suspended. From now on, they had to walk on their feet and bear themselves, whereas hitherto they had been borne by the water. A dreadful heaviness lay upon them. They felt unable to cope with the simplest undertakings. In this new world, they no longer possessed their former guides, their regulating unconscious and infallible drives. They were reduced to thinking, inferring, reckoning, coordinating cause and effect, these unfortunate creatures. They were reduced to their consciousness, their weakest and most fallible organ. I believe there has never been such a feeling of misery on earth, such a leaden discomfort, and at the same time, the old instincts had not suddenly ceased to make their usual demands, only it was hardly or rarely possible to humor them. As a result, they had to seek new and, as it were, subterranean gratifications. The man who, from lack of external enemies and resistances, and forcibly confined to the oppressive narrowness and punctiliousness of custom, impatiently lacerated, persecuted, gnawed at, assaulted, and maltreated, himself. This fool, this yearning and desperate prisoner, became the inventor of the bad conscience. But thus began the gravest and uncanniest illness, from which humanity has not yet recovered man's suffering of man, of himself, the result of a forcible sundering from his animal past, as it were a leap and plunge into new surroundings and conditions of existence, a declaration of war against the old instincts upon which his strength, joy, and terribleness had rested hitherto." Unquote. Once upon a time, fish learned how to walk on land. They did not want to do this. They were forced by some evolutionary pressure to do so or perish. Thus, they entered a dreadful transitionary stage from sea to land animal. Their old instincts were no good on land. They had to forge new ones. Above all, they were now oppressed by a tremendously heavier feeling of gravity. Their own bodies, 
once their means of locomotion and freedom, suddenly felt like heavy burdens, and they must have longed almost to jump out of their skins and fly about in the air like spirits. In the very same way, humans are themselves a transitional stage. We have emerged from the ocean of unconsciousness and moral innocence, and now we trundle about awkwardly on the land of consciousness and moral responsibility, plagued with the depression of guilt, of bad conscience, self-hatred, and every other side effect of having a sense of morality. We are ruled by a new gravity, a heavier gravity, the gravity of ethics, which weighs upon our souls and troubles us sorely at every turn. This gravity arose not because of walking on land, literally, but because of living in cities, in cultures, and communities. It was humanity's collectivization, humanity's civilization, that created this new spirit of gravity. But just as the fish became reptiles and the reptiles became birds, so too, Nietzsche suggests, animals become humans and humans can become overhumans, those beings who are able by nature to dance despite the pull of gravity and perhaps can even fly. They have become powerful enough in their muscles. Their bodies have readjusted. They are so strong of will that they are not troubled by ethics, since it is no great thing for them to obey this or that moral code or commandment should they decide to. Their very discipline under the law makes them free of the law. It is essential to note that Nietzsche is not proposing a return to the sea of unconsciousness, as it were. He is not proposing a morality, but rather to use his term immorality, a transcendence of the community, you could say. One is no longer determined by one's community. One has become self-determined. One does not drag themselves along on their belly but can now play in the air just as they once played in the water. The imagery, this imagery of human beings learning how to fly is going to reappear throughout Zarathustra, and I believe it is best understood in this context I've laid out of a kind of moral transcendence. In short, to be human for Nietzsche is to be sick. Humans are the sick animal. To get better from this illness is to become an overhuman, to get over being human, if you like. And this only happens for Zarathustra when he wills eternal recurrence at the end of the third book in the section entitled The Convalescent, that is, he who is healing after a long illness. Now, you are probably wondering, why did I run through all of this? What does this have to do with those first two lines? Well, in part, I am just going over it because I believe it will serve us well going forward. But it was genuinely triggered in me uh, because Zarathustra is said to have left the lake of his home and then went into the mountains. Zarathustra came up from the water of unconsciousness and journeyed against the natural pull of gravity, which would have dragged him back down to the slumber of custom. He worked against this pull to reach the mountain heights, and he sought to learn how to dance, and perhaps someday to even fly. Home and lake are juxtaposed because symbolically they mean the same thing. They are the comfortable origin, the shire of one's life, the circumstances in which one grew up without knowing any better, the culture and community given to one by the apparently arbitrary event of birth. One more point on these lines. Zarathustra is said to have savored or enjoyed, depending on how you translate the German, his spirit and his solitude. We've already talked about solitude in the last video. 
But what about spirit? The German word used here, which will recur a number of times throughout Zarathustra, is Geist, and it is famously difficult to translate. This is, I think, because it unites multiple concepts together into one word, which in English, those concepts are always demarcated from each other. You have mind, you have spirit, you have ghost or specter or spook, you have holy ghost in Christianity, you have essence. So those are like the five big ones. I know I listed more than five, but mind, spirit, ghost, holy ghost, essence. My totally unqualified attempt to try to unite these into something uh, conceptual is that you could say Geist refers more to a state of mind. Uh, it represents maybe a mental tendency of thought, but also the activities which naturally result from those thoughts. You have uh, Hegel speaking of the zeitgeist, the, the time spirit or spirit of the times. Um, so there's a sense in which it represents, say, the, the gist of something. That is, by mimicking or becoming possessed by the spirit that is attendant upon that thing. So when you get at the gist of something, it's as though the spirit of that thing has possessed you and you have, you have realized it and you are now moving in that direction or something. I, I'm probably reading too much into this, but these are some ideas that come up, at least in the way that Zarathustra seems to use the word. So Zarathustra is said to have savored his own geist, which is to say he savored his unique essence and tendency. He was, if you like, possessed by himself. He wasn't swept away by the zeitgeist, by the spirit of the times, or by the spirit of the community. He regained his own geist, his own spirit, his own essence. He was, if you like, possessed by himself, but also he cultivated that spirit apart from the community and allowed it to express itself individually, uh, you, almost like a gardener, you know, figuring out how to, to get a little sprout to grow, and you don't want it to do that in the city because it won't be able to get enough sun, people might step on it, you know. He's got to go into the mountains to do that. He got in touch with himself so that his body might be possessed by a spirit more in line with who he himself is actually is, which probably sounds circular or paradoxical, and arguably it is, but <laughs> it kind of gets at the heart of some of the problems you run into with, with Nietzsche's, I suppose you could call it moral theory, even though he is against morality on principle, as he says. Anyway, we're going to get more into that in later sections, um, because Nietzsche does have an interesting way of, that seems to address this, where he ties one's identity more to the body, and he seems to regard the body and its evolutionary history as almost a kind of, he does not use this language, but a super spirit, a super geist, an ubergeist, to which the individual ego is subject. This is very Jungian. I mentioned this in the, in the video where I talked about the plot, where I briefly summarized um, on the despisers of the body, which is basically like a crash course in... <laughs> A crash course in the basics of Jungian psychology and, and uh, Freudian psychology in its own way. Um, in any case, Zarathustra goes into the mountains to escape the pollution of the crowd. He must return to solitude so that he can remember himself and his own conceptions. Society is ill-related to reality. Isolation is necessary to restore the proper relation to reality. Zarathustra needs time to accumulate his own experiences. The crowd corrupts the individual through its false dichotomies and categories. Therefore, one must rediscover the true categories in solitude. But I am here speaking far too much like a Christian or simply a moralist here because I am presuming that there is a universal set of categories or a universal reality, that there's one reality, one God, to whom we must relate. But Nietzsche wants to avoid precisely this platonic kind of monotheism, right, where one is trying to align their mode of becoming with the pure being of God or of the forms, right? So Plato posits beings out there which are stable and fixed. They don't change, they don't become. But Nietzsche says, no, that is not the case. Everything is always becoming, 
albeit it's always becoming in the eternal recurrence, and that's where you find something like being, but the being is itself a kind of becoming. In any case, Nietzsche doesn't want to become common. He doesn't like this idea of, oh, everybody should be reaching for the exact same forms. No, he wants to identify with himself. Um, he's very individualistic in that way. There's, we study this in, in Jungian typology because I think this is very much an FI position, but that's uh, if you aren't familiar with typology because I've been trying to make this for a, a wider audience. Don't worry about it. You can watch my other videos for that if you want. Um, anyway, the point is, is, is uh, Nietzsche doesn't want to identify or end up being subsumed by something foreign to him. He wants to justify himself and his own existence. So, the categories of thought and valuation which Zarathustra presumably discovers are simply his own categories, his own mode of being. Whence did they come from? Well, that's where we get into his philosophy of the body, but we'll, we'll wait till later to really get into that. And I do have some criticisms here, but like I said, I'm sort of avoiding that. Um, we'll probably get more into that, like I said, when we get into the despisers of the body, but that'll probably be for a while because we're going at quite the pace right now as I've only covered two lines and it's almost an hour long here. But that's okay. Uh, there's a lot that I want to get off my chest here and there's a lot to talk about, especially right off the beginning. So I hope you've enjoyed this so far and uh, I will see you all in the next video where we will continue talking about um, Zarathustra's prologue, section one. Take care and happy Easter.